Hi, my name is Tess McKean. I'm the Chief Executive of Talent Trust Singapore and I've been in the role for the last five years, which is since the organisation started. I've been in the non-profit sector for about 10 years now um, and prior to that I was working for FMCG marketing brands like Chanel and Bourgeois. So the kind of struggles that local charities are facing are generally either in um, resourcing in terms of people or resourcing in terms of funding. Um, so they have to do a vast amount of work with very little money and very little um, business expertise. Um, so we try to step in to make sure that we are filling that business skills gap to, make, to give them more equitable access to talent. So if you want to help a charity, um, there are two really obvious ways. One is give money um, and the other is give your time. And if you want to give your time to charities, there are again different options. So you can do some more traditional service-based volunteering, which I think we're all quite familiar with, where you would go down and maybe hand out food to the homeless, um, read books to kids, do some gardening. Um, and service-based volunteering is a really wonderful thing to do when charities have a need for it. Um, but actually, if you have very limited time to give and you have business skills and expertise, something called skills-based volunteering, which is what we do, is a really, really effective way to help charities because it means that you're not just helping them for the day, you're helping them for um, a, a far more sustainable future. I would define it as sort of fundamental business skills, financial planning, strategic planning, um, operational execution. Um, you know, when somebody is so busy working on um, on helping their beneficiaries, um, it's very difficult for them to have the time to really step back and do that that planning that keeps people feeling really future ready. Um, I think it's it's very well accepted that for corporate business people, our bottom line that we're working to is money and profit. Um, we're trying to make our bosses richer and ourselves perhaps a little bit richer as well. Um, in the non-profit sector, the bottom line is that if you don't do your job well, there's going to be human suffering um, at, the, at the heart of it. So when that is your bottom line and you're working in a charity, your focus is going to be entirely on trying to benefit those people, trying to make sure that that kid doesn't go home to an abusive parent, trying to make sure that that elderly person doesn't sit at home by themselves without access to healthcare. I think when we talk about um, those fundamental business skills, it's not that charities don't care about that, it's not that they don't know that it's needed, it's just that they have other priorities. So if someone comes in who's a financial planner, someone comes in who's a strap planner, they can make a vast amount of difference by helping making that much easier for the charity to do. Ideally we want people who have both depth and breadth in their career. So um, you'll often find that over the course of a project and Talent Trust projects run for about 12 months, um, different challenges will be thrown at the charity because it's a constantly evolving, constantly moving sector. Um, you know, COVID is the perfect example of that. Um, nobody had any idea that a pandemic was about to hit. Um, so when you have um, volunteer members who have done a whole range of things in their career, they might have gone from startup to, to high level corporate, um, that kind of experience can be very calming and can be very helpful because whatever gets thrown at the charity, there's someone in the room who can help with it. Um, so ideally, our mentors tend to have sort of 10 years plus experience, everything from you know, people that finish their grad programs up to retirees. Um, that being said, if you're five years into your career and you're super specialised and you're super passionate, um, there is always space for you to come and help and advise. We get a few younger marketeers that come and work with us who have you know, real specialism in, in social media marketing, which for a lot of charity stolets who have been working for you know, 20, 30, 40 years in their organisation, they're, they're just not familiar with these kind of newer technologies. Um, so we as an organisation are a charity as well, we have charitable status, we're an IPC. Um, we have a programme fee because um, it's very important for us not to have to charge our charities. As a charity ourselves, we're always advising our beneficiaries to try and diversify their revenue, um, try and become more sustainable themselves and we are trying to follow our own advice. So by having the mentors co-fund their programme, it means that we have a sustainable component to the way that we earn our income as well. Um, 
and it, it also means that we don't have to apply for as many government grants um, and we like the charities that we work with to be able to apply for the government grants and not be in a competitive situation. Um, and finally, it's not the reason why we charge a programme fee, but a, a really nice result of that is that when a mentor signs up with Talent Trust, it means they've got skin in the game. One of the challenges that charities often have when they're working with volunteers is, um, you know, with the best will in the world, it's quite easy to sign up to, to, to a volunteer project. Um, life gets in the way, you know, your kid gets sick, your parents need some help, and all of a sudden you can't show up to be there for the charity. And that can be really challenging when an organisation has made time to, to sit there and listen to you. So actually by, by dedicating some of their personal funding as well or, or their company sponsoring them, it means that our mentors show up really reliably. Um, it means that they develop a much better rapport as a team and they develop much more trust with the ED of the charity um, and that makes for a much more impactful project. So, the matching process for us is a, a fairly complex one. Um, we spend anything up to seven or eight hours pre-scoping the project with the charity before we kick off. Um, and during that time, we try to identify four or five different areas that we know the charity wants to focus on. And also a sense of the personality of the charity's executive director. Um, that's when we go out and start talking to different mentors. And it means that we can go and try to specifically match the mentor's background and experience to those pre-scoped challenge areas. Our teams are comprised normally of um, three to five mentors. And this will depend on the size of the charity as well as the scope of the project um, and the duration of the project. So if we have a quite well defined project with maybe only two or three focus areas, we might put together a team of three mentors um, and a project manager. There will always be a Talent Trust project manager on the team. It's all well and good to have five really experienced senior people, but you don't want five um, alpha persons on one team, neither do you want five introverts on one team. It wouldn't make for great chemistry. So we try and match the mentors as well based on a bit of personality, working style. We ask them to, to fill out a questionnaire that tells us what kind of role they like to play in the team, um, you know, what their friends would say about them. Um, and that gives us a much better sense of, of the chemistry behind the team as well as the, the more technical skills match. You'd be surprised at how little time mentors need to contribute. We actually don't ask girls to contribute any more than two hours a month. Um, the reason why we're able to ask so little of them is that we have project managers that facilitate the entire process. So there's always a Talent Trust project manager who is in the room for the meetings um, and they not only facilitate the conversation, make sure that everybody is sticking to the agenda, but after the mentors have given their invaluable advice and gone back to their day jobs, our project manager steps in to handhold the charity to provide tools and templates and resources that help them to get the work done between the two sessions. We've worked with 34 organisations so far in the last five years um, in a very hands-on way and 100% of those organisations have fed back to us that they feel that after the programme they're a lot more efficient and effective in the way that they run. We're very confident that the programme is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, with our own eyes we witness the growth of the executive directors and, and chief execs that we work with. Um, you can see how much more confident they become um, in areas like pitching, strategic planning. They've reported back to us that their communications and the way that they communicate with their donors has improved massively. Um, that their ability to prioritise their time and the time that the organisation spends on different um, projects has improved um, and that their strat planning has become a lot more effective. So we know from our impact measurement that the programmes are working effectively. Um, what we're looking at doing now for the future is trying to introduce different lengths of projects and different um, options for people. So if, for example, they don't feel that they have the capacity to take on a full year's project, we're starting to do one day workshops. Um, we've just done our first, our first one project um, workshop with Bloomberg, which was highly successful, um, where they brought together some of their um, they call them hypos in the industry, high potential candidates. 
um, who have been on an accelerated learning program and um, their end of year wrap up was a one day workshop with one of our charities and it was highly effective at generating new solutions for um, one of their, their key challenges. So we are trying to improve our efficacy by offering more options to the sector basically.